Hi, this is Michael Megali and Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation. And this is case 102 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This is a patient who was actually referred for PCI of an LADCTO. However, a different procedure was done as will be discussed shortly. The patient did have a history of multiple previous coronary revascularizations. She has had three coronary bypass graft surgeries, as well as multiple percutaneous coronary interventions, and presented with severe medically refractory angina, as well as anterior ischemia on the stress testing. This was her angiogram a year prior, demonstrated a flash occlusion of the left main with a patent lima to LED with some stenosis within previously placed stents and some under great flow. The native right coronary was patent, giving some collateral flow to the distal LED, and so was a saphenous vein graft to a large diagonal branch. At this presentation, the RCA had not any significant change and was supplying a collateral to the distal LED as before. The vein graft was also patent, however, there was no longer undergrade flow from the lima into the native coronary vessel. So the initial referral was for PCI of the LADCTO. But before undertaking that, the first step is to perform a dual angiogram. And here is an injection from the lima, simultaneously injection from the native right coronary artery. And when we look at the dual injection, it now becomes apparent that the patient does not actually have a CTO. Instead, there is a high-grade lesion in the native LAD distal to the lima touchdown, which is creating competitive flow from the RCA as well as the lima graft. So this is not a CTO, and therefore that makes things much easier and highlights the importance of dual angiography to plan CTO-PCI. In some cases, like this one, the patient may not actually have a CTO, but he or she may have a high-grade lesion that appears to be a CTO on single injections. Wiring was easy using a workhorse Xeon Blue Guide wire. We still use the microcatheter for support, but again, wire was fairly simple without any difficulty. And then we perform intravascular ultrasound to examine this area. And I was demonstrated uh, an area of uh, gap within the previously placed stents. There was also some external compression of the vessel as can be seen in those frames. And that corresponded in this segment of the previously placed stents. So what the patient actually had was stent fracture. At the site of the lima anastomosis, there was stent fracture and separation of the previously placed stent. There is the stent more proximal, stent more distal by IVUS, but in this particular segment, there is no stent, likely because of stent fracture and separation. And actually, hinge motion or extrinsic compression is one of the potential causes of stent fracture that likely contributed to this complication in this particular patient. However, the highest grade lesion was not at the site of the fracture, but more distal in the native vessel, and that is why it was stent with one drag eluting stent, provided a nice final result as confirmed by Ivus, who just performed balloon angioplasty of the previously placed lima stents without placing additional stents. The patient actually did well and did not have any angina at three months follow-up. So what are the lessons from this particular case? First of all, dual angiography is critical for understanding the anatomy in CTO-PCI. Sometimes the patient may not have a CTO as was the case in our patient. The second one is to use intravascular imaging in cases of stent failure, such as in stent restenosis, to determine the mechanism of the stent failure. In this case, it appeared to be stent fracture, likely because of the hinge motion of the lima distal anastomosis to the LAD. When we have stent fracture, it is best to avoid restanding that area because repeat stent fracture may occur. Thank you.